Thunderstorms can be very bad things to fly through. They can cause lightning strikes, they can cause severe turbulence and also cause our instruments to malfunction and even fail. So we want to avoid them at all costs and that's why we use a weather radar. Hi, I'm Grant and welcome to the 10th class in the radio navigation series. Today we're going to be having a look at weather radar. This is a type of radar system that's on board the aircraft that we use to detect rain droplets, clouds and big thunderstorms. That way we can avoid them and have a nice smooth flight. An airborne weather radar is used by modern commercial aircraft to detect weather in the air while flying. It uses primary pulse based radar like we looked at in class 9 to detect water droplets and other precipitation like ice and hail within clouds. It isn't very good at detecting the clouds themselves just the precipitation that is within them or below them. In order to detect the precipitation, we want to use some of the principles that we learnt about in the previous class. Hopefully you remember that we want to have a wavelength that is similar in size or smaller than the object. We want a frequency that has line of sight propagation and we want the pulses spaced nicely so we get the returns within a suitable time frame before the next pulse is sent out. On that note, the weather radar uses a frequency in the super high frequency band between 9 and 10 gigahertz, which gives us a wavelength of about 3 centimeters and a pulse recurrence frequency of 250 to 400 pulses per second. This limits the range to between 200 to 320 nautical miles, which will give us plenty of time to maneuver around any weather that might cause damage to the aircraft or passengers on board. The aerial that the radar beam is sent out is fitted to the nose of the aircraft and is a slotted scanner array. This allows it to be swept back and forth electronically and it can go 90 degrees either way giving a full 180 degree uh, view of the uh, sky ahead. The beam is about 4 degrees wide vertically and horizontally and it can be tilted up or down by about 15 degrees. Some manufacturers might have slightly different values, but they will be near to these numbers. The aerial will also be gyro stabilized in pitch and roll so that the sweep and the tilt are always with respect to the Earth's horizontal rather than the aircraft's pitch. For example, if we have five degrees of tilt up set and our aircraft pitch is three degrees, then we only need to pitch the weather radar up by an additional two degrees to get that five degree relative to the horizontal because of that stabilization. In the cockpit, the radar returns are displayed on the navigation display on modern aircraft at least. The ND or navigation display is a top down view of the aircraft often displaying the planned route, the current track with the heading, as well as information such as speeds, winds, your next waypoint, your time you're gonna get there, uh, any VORs that you have tuned and other such information can be tuned. They can be highly customizable and each aircraft will have a slightly different uh, set of options that you can display on the ND. With the weather radar selected on, it will show areas of precipitation in increasing strength in a traffic light system from green, yellow to red and the most intense areas being this magenta purplish colour. The colour on its own is not an indication of turbulence and danger. Large drain droplets falling from a cloud close to the ground may show as red, but the conditions might mean that it's fairly stable and there isn't that much danger associated with. What we are most interested in for turbulence avoidance is avoiding updrafts which occur at the edge of the thunderstorms. The severity of these updrafts is often shown by a rapidly changing colour from green through yellow to red and magenta. We need to be aware of something else called radar shadowing as well. This is when one storm area of precipitation blocks another one behind it because it is so reflective that the storm casts a shadow behind it where we can't detect anything else. So in this example here, there could well be a storm hidden in here, but because we're getting all of our returns reflected off of this initial storm and this storm, we don't actually know but this area over here, there's nothing blocking it, so we can be fairly sure that our route through class, study and exam waypoints is going to be clear of the weather. 
The display is only that. It is a display of the weather. It is up to us as pilots to, to interpret the data provided to us and decide to fly through it or around it. We might see a return on the weather radar and not know how bad the precipitation is. And in order to help analyze the situation, we can use the tilt and gain controls. Tilt is used to give a more accurate view of the height of any areas of heavy precipitation or cloud tops. And we can see if we're above it, below it, or at the same level. A lot of aircraft will have an auto tilt function where the beam of the weather radar is tilted up and down according to the altitude of the aircraft so the beam is always aimed at an appropriate level. If we want to analyze manually, we can switch the weather radar into a manual tilt mode and adjust the angle of the beam with respect to the horizon using a little dial. Clever use of the manual tilt can be used to determine the height of cloud tops or areas of high intensity precipitation. The way we do this is we basically tilt the radar until the screen is showing nothing. You can imagine the beam pointing up at 15 degrees here. It's not going to detect, detect this uh, cloud over here. Then what we do is we slowly, slowly, slowly reduce or increase the tilt until we just get returns. These would be the cloud tops. Then we can use the formula of height difference equals the nautical miles that we get the echoes from times tilt minus half the beam width times 100. For example, in this uh, situation here, if we'd chosen to investigate an area of storms using this method and we find that we were getting returns at 60 nautical miles with a tilt of minus one and a beam width of four degrees and we were at 35,000 feet, what height are the cloud tops at? This is a simple plug in the numbers and calculate problem. So our height difference, let's just call it H, D for short, is the nautical mile where we're getting D returns, that's 60, times the tilt is minus one. Make sure and keep the minus symbol because that'll give you a negative number, meaning that it's below, which from the diagram we can clearly see is. Minus half the beam width, so it's gonna be minus two, and then we're gonna times that as well by 100. So we've got 60 times minus one, minus two, minus three, times 100. And then if we calculate that all out, that's gonna be minus, quite far down actually, it's gonna be minus 18,000 feet below us. So at 35,000 feet, the actual height of the tops is at 17,000 feet. So at 35,000 feet, we are well above these clouds and we can safely fly over it. Gain is a slightly different control and it's basically thought of as sensitivity. I think of it as gaining more information. If we turn up the gain, we get loads more sensitivity and we gain lots more information. It might not be wanted, but you get more of it. This would likely mean areas of less intense precipitation start to show or even show as more intense precipitation than they really are. If we turn the gain down, it reduces the sensitivity. So only those areas with the most intense precipitation are shown. This control can be used to judge which areas are the most intense and have priority in terms of avoiding. Most modern radars have turbulence detection built in as well. This uses the Doppler effect to detect horizontal movements of water droplets in the air. This will subsequently paint a turbulence return on the radar, which is usually this red checkerboard pattern. And as well as turbulence, we can also use the Doppler effect to predict areas of wind shear, which is sent which is essentially a very intense form of horizontal turbulence. When the predictive wind shear option is switched on, the weather radar will detect areas where the wind velocities and directions are changing over a short distance, indicating wind shear. This system is usually active below 2,300 feet, where these weather phenomena are most common and most critical. The display in the aircraft will usually be a large set of red letters on the primary flight display, saying wind shear ahead along with an audio signal saying the same thing. It'll go wind shear ahead, wind shear ahead. It is then up to the pilots to either perform a wind shear escape maneuver or override the system and judge that the wind shear detected is not important enough. For example, if you've got the warning at 50 feet off the ground before landing, you're probably just going to land because the area of predicted wind shear is likely quite far ahead. A secondary use of weather radar is to use it to detect terrain instead of weather. This might be useful in a mountainous area when flying in clouds, for example. 
it is very good for the pilot's situational awareness. In reality, this is quite a primitive use of the weather radar system because most modern aircraft will have a terrain database with accurate information in it. The terrain database is compared to the aircraft's position and height and a display is generated on the navigation display showing the areas of high terrain and how far above or below the aircraft they are. And this new system of the terrain database also allows for weather radar to be used for its primary purpose as well as having the terrain information available so you get both. So a nice quick class there in summary, our beam that is fired out of an airborne weather radar out of a slotted array antenna is between 9 and 10 gigahertz. Its wavelength is about 3 centimeters and its pulse recurrence frequency is about 250 to 400 pulses per second, which gives it a range of 200 to 320 nautical miles. We can tilt it 15 degrees up or down to the horizontal and the beam itself is a cone shaped about 4 degrees wide and 4 degrees tall and it can be swept back and forth 90 degrees electronically to produce a nice wide 180 degree uh, vision of the sky ahead of us. Obviously, these numbers are kind of general weather radar. Specific manufacturers might have slightly different numbers for these things. We can use the tilt and gain controls to adjust the angle of the beam with respect to the horizontal or the, the horizon, I think you could call it and the gain adjusts the sensitivity. Gain adjusts the sensitivity in order to detect the areas which are most problematic and that we definitely want to avoid versus areas that are maybe painting a bit uh, over enthusiastically and aren't actually as bad as they seem. And tilt is used to find the height of these areas of intense precipitation or the cloud tops. We can use this formula. It's the nautical miles, times tilt minus half the beam width times 100 to find out an estimate of how far above or below the tops or the areas of uh, intense precipitation are. Once that's all done, we get a display on our navigation display on a modern jet aircraft, which looks something like this. You get the green, yellow, red areas of increasing intensity of precipitation. You get the red checkerboard or chessboard sort of marks indicating areas of turbulence which are detected using the top the Doppler effect and using that Doppler effect we can also get predictive wind shear warnings and uh, we might have to perform a wind shear escape maneuver if uh, it is necessary. Another thing to think about is the shadowing effect because this storm here is very big it's going to bounce off all of our returns from the weather radar we don't necessarily know what's happening behind and on that note it's actually important to make sure you've got the correct scale set so this uh, navigation display can zoom in and zoom out if i was to zoom all the way in obviously it's going to be pretty hard to do on the paper but if you can imagine my little square of my display was only this big then i wouldn't have any information obviously that big but zoomed out just that area zoomed in then i wouldn't have any information about this storm off to the right hand side of the aircraft whereas if i zoom in i get more information so having the scale correctly set is also very important for uh, understanding where weather is and finally the last thing you can do is use the weather radar to detect ground returns and uh, mountainous areas usually the ground returns um, are given, well, aren't actually used because we use a terrain database. If, for example, this display here was showing terrain and weather, how you would differentiate between the two is the terrain would probably have some sort of pattern on it, like this. Like a hatched pattern or something like that, so you know that the hatched markings are terrain and the ones that aren't hatched are the weather and the turbulence. And obviously, you're not going to get the turbulence marks. Uh, around terrain. 